Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that this morning you'll help us to understand your word. We pray that you'll give us both ears to hear and hearts to respond. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. A couple of days ago, in the Church of England newspaper, the Bishop of Bradford, Nick Baines, wrote this. I have got into trouble now and then for making what seem like wild suggestions. For example, I question the traditional Easter responses in churches across the world when the priest cries out, Alleluia, Christ is risen. And the congregation responds, he is risen indeed, alleluia. I think a more biblically accurate response would be something like, what? You've got to be joking. (laughs) It's not very often that you hear me publicly agreeing with a bishop. But miracles do happen. But he's right, isn't he? We only make that response because we know what happened. When we read the stories about how they arrive at this tomb of Joseph of Arimathea's, the sense we have is that they're full of bewilderment. What on earth does this mean? Now, of course, the stories in the Gospels all differ slightly from each other. You won't read an identical story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Luke's account, which Beryl's just read to us, of course, there's no story about Mary Magdalene coming back to the tomb and meeting someone who she thinks is the gardener. There's no appearance even of Jesus in Luke's account. I could have asked Beryl to read on. This morning you will help us to understand your word. We pray that you will give us both ears to hear and hearts to respond. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen In Luke chapter 24. And what we would have immediately found ourselves in the midst of would have been the story of two disciples walking to the village of Emmaus, a story which many of us know. And for Luke, the story of the road to Emmaus is the resurrection story. Before that moment, for Luke, no one has seen Christ alive. People have just declared him to be alive. And... For these two men who are walking on that journey, if they were both men, one of them could have been a woman, yes, I know. For these two people. Even when they meet him, they don't know quite who he is. That happens later. So let's look at what Luke says and try and work out what he's trying to tell us. Because this, of course, is gospel. It's good news. That's what the word means. Good news for you and me. Very early in the morning, a group of women arrive at Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. In Luke's account, they see that the stone has already been moved away from the entrance to the tomb. And they look inside, but they don't find anything there. 
From what's said a bit later, there was a set of grave clothes lying there, but nothing else, no body. And two glorious beings suddenly appear and tell them that they should not be looking for the living amongst the dead. He is not here, they say. He is risen. Go and tell the eleven. And they go and do that. And because it's a bunch of women, no one believes them. Some things don't change, do they? But it was more true then than it is now. You couldn't accept the testimony of a woman in a court of law in that culture. And it seems to these men a fanciful story. We're told that Peter is so puzzled that he goes to the tomb. He looks in, he sees just grave clothes there. And he leaves. And he's feeling bewildered doesn't know what's going on. The common factor in all of these stories demonstrates to us very, very clearly that no one, not even Jesus' closest friends and followers, was expecting what happened to happen. They thought he was dead. And when they discovered that there was another story going on, their reaction is shock, horror, bewilderment, surprise. And Luke, I think, accurately recounts that story as he's writing all of this down many years later. So why does Luke tell the story in this particular way? It isn't that all the other things that the other Gospels recount never happened. They did. The story does all fit together. It's just that different aspects of it are recorded by the different Gospel writers. And Luke is telling this story in a particular way because he wants us to take some particular lessons away from it, which are good news to us. And his emphasis, when this group of women arrive, is around the fact that two glorious beings appear in the confines of this tomb. Now the clear implication of that, it seems to me, particularly to to Luke's Jewish readers, was this. That in the Jewish temple certainly in the Jewish temple of the Old Testament, there was a place at the very centre of it called the Holiest of Holy Places, where throughout most of the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was placed. The Ark of the Covenant was a golden box which had been made by Moses. It was covered by a golden slab called the Mercy Seat. And it was believed by the Jews that this mercy seat was the dwelling place of God. This was the seat, if you like, where the uncreated glory of God came to dwell in the midst of his people. It was hidden behind a thick veil because people were sinful. And God, who was holy, could have nothing to do with sinful people. And the only person who was allowed into this holiest of holy places was the high priest who once a year had to go in with the blood of a sacrifice to atone for the sins of himself and the people. But at either end of this mercy seat, this golden box, which is in the holiest of holy places, were depictions of two cherubim or two glorious angels which overshadowed this place with their wings. This was the place of the living presence of the Almighty. And at the crucifixion, 
when Jesus yields up his spirit to God, the veil that existed in the temple, a veil which was a thick veil and about 15 feet high, was ripped in two from top to bottom in that moment, in a scene which must have been profoundly embarrassing for every priest in that temple. Ripped in two by God himself. Because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ means that God is no longer confined in that place by the sin of men and women. And that the presence of God goes wherever faith is. It can be found anywhere. God is no longer just living in this place behind a veil. And this is why John later on says in the book of Revelation, when he's describing heaven and for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it no more is there any need for this elaborate temple and for an elaborate set of rituals whereby humans may approach the living God God has got out God is out of the box He is no longer confined by any of these things. In fact, when those women got into the tomb, they actually saw it depicted for them by these glorious beings who appeared to atone for the sins of himself and the people. But at either end of this mercy seat, this golden box, which was in the holiest of holy places, were depictions of two cherubim, either side of them it says, one at one end and one at the other. And they thought to themselves, this is the very presence of the living God. But it's not over there in that temple that still stands, it's here. Did they understand that at the time? I'm not sure they did. In retrospect, I'm sure they understood what it meant. And so God is out there now. We don't need to access him in special ways. He's there for anyone who believes. And isn't it interesting that when Jesus speaks to the two people who are travelling to Emmaus on that day... His words are, how foolish you are and how slow you are to believe everything that the prophets have said. And they find suddenly that they recognize him as he sits at table and breaks bread. And then as, just as quickly, he's gone. And as we read on in Luke 24 we find he begins to teach them more and more about a future when they won't see him all the time as they have seen him as he has walked on earth. He says, I'm giving you a task to do. I want you from this day, he says to his disciples, to look forward. Because there's a day coming very soon when you'll be endued with power from on high. I want you to stay here until that happens. And so the lesson I think that Luke is trying to get over to people like us, the good news, is that from that resurrection morning, the dwelling place of God is not behind a veil in a temple, but it is with anyone who believes in him. The dwelling place of God is here amongst us. He's here with us today as we worship him. This is an awesome place to be in, but it's not special. It's an awesome place to be anywhere, especially because this is Yorkshire. But more than that, that anyone who will but believe this message that Christ is risen and that he is alive, will become a key player in the growing and increasing kingdom of God. And if you too will believe 
that God empowers you and endues you with power from on high and sends you out to be part of that growing and increasing kingdom. That's what you are called to do. And some of us say to ourselves, what, me? And God says, yes, you. You, 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 and you. Every one of you. And we hear a word like that and sometimes we're surrounded by bewilderment. (laughs) Is this really happening to me? Does God love me that much? Does God want to use me for his kingdom? And the answer is yes, he does. And if we feel a bit bewildered by that and wonder what it is that we should do, well, we could do a lot worse between now and Pentecost this year, which is in the middle of May, than to reflect on this meaning of the resurrection, which Luke is trying to communicate to every one of us. To obey the risen Jesus Christ means to seek after an endowment with power from heaven, and to step up to the plate of transforming a broken world. And as Christ is in our midst this morning, and as we encounter him in bread and wine, as many of us will, that's the call. Let us pray for the grace to respond to the risen Christ. Christ.